I don't think you could have convinced me that with 7.30 to go, Washington could take a two-score lead here if they're able to cash in. Second down and a short two just inside the Denver 15-yard line. Robinson's the back, gets a handoff, turns at the 10, now cuts left at the 5. He breaks a tackle into the end zone! Touchdown! Touchdown, Washington! The second of the game for B-Rob! He goes straight into the stands to the burgundy faithful. Look, Brian Robinson, he said last offseason he wasn't entirely feeling himself. He said, wait until you see what I can do when I do. And what he can do is do... Use his great vision on the cutback. Again, the Denver Broncos come with a linebacker blitz, and when you bring a blitz, you're short on the on the on the second level to stop that play. Great vision, great cut by B Rob. Wow. Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, served by Applebee's. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Happy Hour. I'm Connor Rogers alongside Matthew Berry and Jay Croucher. Commanders are 2-0. and Commanders are 2-0. and There are no teams that can say they had defeated the Commanders this year because they're 2-0. and It's amazing what happens when you bring in new ownership. It's amazing. It also helps when you play two teams that aren't that good. But whatever! Commanders are 2-0. and Let's not talk about the last play. It's whatever. It's 2-0. I don't know how that is. Yeah. I just want to say, of all the amazing plays that happened yesterday, we've let off the show with Brian Robinson converting second and one. Yeah. <laughs> to beat the 10 Yeah, you can tell where this show is We're going to go 5-12. Right, yeah, yes. What do you say? You, what, what, you, what, it's you RB1, Brian with? Robinson. Yeah. Yeah, by the Thank way. Thank you Michael very Parsons much. Michael having the greatest game of all time. No, that's fine. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, Jay, like, I understand you're poo-pooing it a little bit, but just to be clear, a year ago at this time, you know what Brian Robinson was doing? Recovering from being shot. It was very good yesterday. He was being re- he was recovering from being shot. What were you doing? <laughs> not you were not doing. doing that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you were like you know you were throwing a New York Liberty jersey on your daughter and trying to train her in the ways of you know betting on sports. <laughs> Let the yeah. daughter at least be a teenager before she becomes a degenerate. Yeah, for the love of God. That's exactly what I was doing. I knew it. <laughs> Just, <Right>. whatever. <laughs> Just whatever. Just <laughs> whatever. By the way, wasn't even like wasn't even the most incredible play in that game. Wasn't even the most incredible play in that quarter. No. You know, like um, what was the feeling like when the hail mary was converted? I wish I was next to you for I, that. But I, I, I know the the fact of the matter is is that I didn't see it live. I was uh, we I was do, I was doing a pre tape thing for Football Night in America on NBC and Peacock. I'm a company man, and so I was doing this this pre tape thing. And uh, so I didn't hear, and all of a sudden I heard James Kaminsky, uh, JK, who's one of our producers, go, oh my God, he caught it. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> Who caught what? <laughs> Who caught what? And I looked over and then I saw the, you know, and I saw the replay, I'm like, oh. Like, I thought we had this. I thought we had this. And then, um, anyway, but then it turns out we did. Yeah, strangely, out- strangely no comment yet from you about um, the potential pass interference on the final I did, play. I, I did, feel like when, on, when the Giants and Commanders uh, played on. last year, we hang covered that. Had the I, got, I did get how the, how the, how the turns <laughs> tables. Yeah, I look. Uh, I, I did admit on Twitter, I said like, hey, we might have gotten away with one, <laughs> but we might. But that was just look, as bad okay, as the Giants. I disagree. Commanders. I disagree. No, 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 no. Hang on for a second. Here. I, I want and there goes center the center camera here. No, no. Hang on for very quickly. Right. The, the pass interference was like this yeah. on the on the broad, which pass interference for sure. Oh. But the pass interference against Curtis Samuel last year was this the whole, before yeah, the ball came in. That's okay. Fair. Like let, it was like massively like. The, no. the other one, had the other one been called, the one against the Commanders um, this week, absolutely, 100%, no. would have been a legit call. I wouldn't have been like, ah, come on. Yeah. But it was, it's also the kind of thing that gets not called a lot. The one from last year that I kept going on and on and on about, where he literally was hugging him, yes, it was and, hug. and he was so close to him. Like, he had him close, and he had the – like, that's illegal in a couple of states. I'm just saying that particular move is uh, illegal in a couple of backward states. I'm just saying, you know, yep. it's different for everyone on Twitter that was yelling at me, saying, like, hey, Barry, you're going to have the same kind of energy. The answer is no, because I'm a homer, <laughs> damn it. I'm a Washington Commander's homer, and we're 2-0 for the first time since 2011. Yep. So I don't want to hear it. 
Good imitation of uh, press man coverage on Connor. Yeah, Rogers you still as got well. your dad strength. Yeah. <laughs> it's Thank it's you, good. Man. You haven't lost the dad strength yet. It's, it's good to see, Barry. Yeah, Let's jump into the Roto World player news. Uh, yes, the Washington Commanders are two and zero, but we are going to start here with the Ravens' win over the Bengals. Another rocky start for Joe Burrow. The Ooh, stat I, line. I, I think I got to second base with Connor. Yes, just you so did. You know. It's yeah. almost the Jay Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, reaching yeah, that territory. One night, well, yeah. one night in Buffalo. Round one night in Buffalo. Though. One disaster in East Lansing. Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Listen, another rocky start one, for Joe Burrow, in Stanford. Uh, right, who is got? who is hurt in this game. You know, another, the calf still bothering him. He's, he finishes 27-41 for 222 yards, two touchdowns, interception. But that doesn't really tell the whole story of this game. And we got to hear from Joe Burrow on the Bengals' slow start after the game. Obviously, you don't want to start on two. Uh, it's not not what we were planning on, not, not what you want to do at all. But, uh, you know, we're going to bounce back. That's what we do. Um, that's all there is to it. When when your quarterback misses camp, it's it's tough to it's tough to start fast. Uh, it's uh, it's not an ideal situation. What happened on the, on the calf? Like yeah, it's tweaked it a little bit again. Uh, you know, we'll see where it is tomorrow. Could you have, could you have came back out and played? Yeah, I was going to come back out. Jay, what if I told you that Joe Burrow is now QB thirty in points per game through the first two weeks of the season? What if I told you that he's playing the Los Angeles Rams next uh, next week and the Bengals are only three and a half point favorites against uh, Puka Nakua and friends? I mean, the big thing here is his injury and the fact that he's tweaked his calf and looks like he may not play this coming week. We'll see about that. But even when he was out on the field before he tweaked it, the offense just isn't, it's just not there at the moment. I really understand it, but 5.4 out yards average depth target, that's not... That's not the Bengals' offense, and now they're 0-2 and in a massive hole, and they've had their two losses to the two teams in the division, most likely to win it, so that really messes them problem. up for tiebreakers, and yeah, I, don't know, I don't know where this is going now, Matthew. Uh, I get that. Uh, I will say, I think where it's going is it's going to be easier. Here's our upcoming schedule. They play the Rams, as you mentioned, on Monday Night Football. Pukua, Apuka Nakua, as brilliant as he is, can't play defense. Uh, yet. Then that, yet. Yeah, it's fair. It's a fair point. Then they're at Tennessee, they're at Arizona, they're home to Seattle. So there's not a defense coming up in the next four weeks that scares you. That a normal Joe Burrow with normal Chamar Chase, normal T. Higgins should, you know, be able to put up points here. He doesn't look like the he doesn't look like the same guy. Uh, to your point, four of his last five regular season games, he's had 225 or fewer passing yards. I get all that. Um, I think that I am willing to bet more on talent and hang tough as it were having said that i think that at least in the short term like, i'm not selling low so to speak no. you know what i mean like people are like i i'm not selling low i'm not doing anything silly like that but if i'm heading into waivers depending on the rest of your team needs am i looking at like if jordan loves out there if sam howell jokes aside is out there you know some some of these guys that might potentially be better than you know being on the road i'm sorry they're home to my, the rams Super Bowl a rematch from two years ago uh, on Monday Night Football, then I might think about it here in the short term until the calf is 100%. Yep. So last night, the line for that game opened Bengals minus six. Now this morning, it's minus three and a half. So some people don't think that Joe Burrow is going to play. What To be fair, what that it means is that there is a risk that he doesn't play. That doesn't mean that he's definitely out, because if he's definitely out, then it's going to move closer to pick. Uh, so this is like saying like a 50% chance he it. plays. Yeah, exactly. So it's not a real line at the moment. He'll end up at something else, but uh, that's certainly a bad indicator. Because, I mean, he, he actively tweaked it. It wasn't right. just a you know, discomfort. He pulled up limp from it. So I don't know. I'm not sure he's going to play. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, I mean, the, uh, the, the, if, if, if he's out, Browning is the... Uh, yeah, Jake uh, Browning. Uh, Jake, Washington Jake, legend. Uh, Washington legend. There yes. you go. Not Washington, D.C., but the state of Washington. Yes, West Coast. West Coast, Washington. The lesser Washington, as uh, some people Some would say it. that. Some Depends. Would refer to it. Some. Like, Depends who you're talking to. Anyway, um, you're still starting. Look, it was nice to see T. T Higgins get up the schneid. I'm not worried about Jamar Chase. Ultimately, he'll be fine as well. Mixon had a solid game. Uh, I think. I think, though, as you head into waivers tomorrow, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow, and hopefully we'll get more clarity on Joe Burrow's situation, but I do think it's worth, whether Burrow goes or not, he's clearly not 100%, I think it is worth grabbing another quarterback if you have one viable in your league. Uh, but, look, the Bengals have been 0-2 before, and they've been just fine. I believe in the team. I believe in Burrow. I'm not panicking just yet, but it's not great. There's no question. 
On the other side of this game, of course, the Ravens come out with the win and the backfield split after J.K. Dobbins tears his Achilles. Pretty even between Gus Edwards and Justice Hill. Gus Edwards gets 10 carries for 62 yards, and he gets the touchdown. Justin Hill, who had two touchdowns last week, he gets one more carry, 11 carries for 41 yards, did not get the touchdown in this one. Barry, I think it seems pretty obvious that this is who the Ravens are going to be without J.K. Dobbins. A pretty even split for these guys. Yeah, and I think it's just, I think they're both flex plays, and they're both touchdown-dependent flex plays. It paid off for Gus Edwards yesterday, right, where he gets into the end zone. Justice Hill did, and I think the concern for me on Justice Hill is he really wasn't involved in the passing game. Like, that was the pro-Justice Hill argument was like, oh, well, he'll be involved in the passing game. And even in the game in which Odell Beckham Jr. left early, and the Ravens were moving the ball reasonably effectively, he only had three receptions, right? I mean, and now, here's the positives of Justice Hill for those that, like, spent a decent amount of fab budget on him or a high waiver pick. He played 54% of the team snaps. He played 50% of the snaps on third and fourth down, and he had six to seven snaps inside the 10. It does seem like they like him in the red zone package. I know that Edwards ultimately converted the touchdown, but, like, Hill got, like, I think two attempts before... Edwards converted and maybe going forward they'll use Edwards more because he's always been kind of that north south north south converter but um I feel like just as a general blanket statement and it was a quiet day for Zay Flowers as well but six different wide receivers against Cincinnati had uh got work here five of the six had three or more targets this feels like Kansas City light in this sense Kansas City it's just kind of like as awesome as that offense is you're starting Mahomes, you're starting Kelsey, and the rest is sort of like, I'm hoping, right? And I just sort of feel like that's the way with the, the Ravens, that it's Lamar Jackson and Mark Andrews, and then I would put Zay Flowers in that mix. Like, I think you can continue to start him. It was a quieter game for him in week two than it was in week one, but still, like, you can still see the explosiveness and the ability there. But other than those three guys, like, you know I mean? Nelson Aguilar caught a touchdown here. Like, I was hoping... I had a lot of hopes on Rashad Bateman, who I loved coming out of college, was a first-round pick, has shown flashes in the pros. But, like, it's clear, like, uh uh-uh. Not on Todd Mock. Even when OBJ went out, Rashad Bateman couldn't get a sniff. I think early last week, it looked like there might be there might be clarity with Baltimore and that J.K. Dobbins will be the running back, Zay Flowers will be the number one wide receiver, and then Mark Andrews will come back and he'll be the tight end and those three guys will all be viable. And now we're basically back to, like you said, Kansas City Light or even just Baltimore last year, but with just different names in the yeah. same slots. And now we've just got different versions of Devin Duvernay and Demarcus Robinson and all these guys where Zay Flowers, he ended up getting the 62 yards with the four receptions, but he only got five targets. He had a 48% target share the week before. That obviously declined. And then the running backs, these guys, you're just not going to know who's going to get in the end zone each week so outside of Jackson and and Andrews I mean you're hoping for Zay Flowers that he improves as the year goes on and gets more target share but you're not feeling good about anyone and while we got on the air we have an update on OBJ's injury from uh, Ian Rappaport who said this has been described as a minor ankle injury rap sheet has said his understanding is that Beckham is managing the issue and if all goes well it should not affect his availability going forward But even with the positive injury news here, Barry, I got to go back to your point that this is a classic quarterback tight end offense and the rest is a dart throw. A hundred percent. Beckham will have a good game or two at some point in the future, but trying to predict when that will be, barring like just massive injuries across the board to the Ravens, it's hard to, like, again, they, you know, when, when Nelson Aguilar is out there, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's too much of a, um, it's good for the Ravens. It's tough for us in the world of fantasy. By the way, I like the phrasing of managing his injury. Like, what is that? What is that Just actually? Not ignoring what is it? it? What is it ma- managing? Listen, I want you to steal third on, the, on, <laughs> yeah. on pitch three. What's he? What's he managing? It, whatever. Odell Beckham Jr. is is receiving treatment from medical professionals. He's, yes. He's not managing anything. Indeed. It's, it's anyway. But anyway, whatever. But uh, so we hope uh, Beckham gets better soon. But yes, it's the clarity is is that Jackson Andrews. Zay Flowers to an extent, and if yep. you want to, if you're desperate in a deeper league, touchdown dependent flexes at the running backs, and that's it. Yep. Moving over to the Chiefs, who travel to Jacksonville and come out with the win with the return, of course, Chris Jones and Travis Kelsey in this game, and you know, kind of a, a letdown, I think, on the offensive side yeah. of the ball in this game, especially from the Jacksonville side. I mean, the final is only 17 to nine, no touchdowns for Trevor Lawrence through the air. Christian Kirk, who we, we talked about it all week, right? We talked about how wow, what a return for Calvin Ridley, and how about you know Zay Jones. 
And then Christian Kirk, who had a really quiet game. We talked about how you could attack the slot against Kansas City. We talked about that we thought Christian Kirk would have a good game this week. Yeah, he was going to come back to life. Yep. But he ends up with 14 targets, 11 catches for 110 yards. He was the standout for Jacksonville's offense. It only put up nine points on the day. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? It, it's, you know, he had a 34% target share in week two. The second most targets among pass catchers in week two through, through Sunday. Um, this was a disappointing game on both sides of the ball, candidly. I mean, the, the over-under going into this game, I believe, was 51. It was the highest on the Week 3 slate. Final score, 17-9. to 9. It was 3 nothing for a long time in the yeah. second quarter. Yeah, safe to say the under hit um, with room to spare. I, I don't know. I, they were bad in the red zone, right? I, this stat is crazy to me. Trevor Lawrence went 0-7 for 7 in the red zone against Kansas City. That is the most attempts without a completion inside the red zone since Brett Favre in 2006. <laughs> Uh, you know, like, he came, by the way, like, this close to nailing Ridley in the back of the yeah. end zone. Like, just overthrew it by literally, like, half an inch. And, you know, Ridley tried to get his feet down and wasn't, wasn't able to. I don't know. I I, I sort of don't have a uh, – Zay Flowers also uh, – sorry, uh, Zay Jones left this game as well. He got a little bit banged up. I, I don't know. I'm just sort of chalking this one up to whatever. I don't know. You know what I mean? I just – I like – when my rankings come out for week three, I will still have Kevin Ridley the highest among pass catchers. Depends on Zay Jones' availability. I think Jones and Kirk maybe be a little bit closer, um, uh, you know, uh, when they play Houston this week. That's a positive. I think they do get back, you know, in a groove um, here as well. Not really worried about Trevor Lawrence as well. Just all feels – there's just so much inconsistent quarterback play. It just feels like – Panicking too much on any of these early quarterbacks is, is a lot. I think the key stat out of this one is that Jacksonville went 3 of 14 on 3rd and 4th down. And a lot of those were very close plays. And if you just get two extra of those, then you keep the chains moving. Everyone gets more yards. It looks a little bit better. It was just all a little bit off on yeah. both sides of the ball. I think another takeaway from this is that Travis Etienne is getting kind of a workhorse uh, workload in terms of his percentage of the carries. He's not really getting eaten into. He didn't have a good game. But again, that continued on from week one. But yeah, I don't think there's too much to read into the Jacksonville side. I think the Kansas City side is probably more interesting, Matthew, with the pass catches. Just real quickly on your point about ETN, he played 73% of the snaps even though he left the game uh, towards the end. With, uh, but it turns out it's just cramps. He should be fine uh, for the game against Houston where he will be a top 10 play for me. Yeah, I mean, like, Kansas City was just all over the place. Like, after Stumbles Travis Kelsey. Back. Right, right, I mean, right. Travis Kelsey was, uh, after Travis Kelsey, I want to say off the top of my head, something like five different Chiefs wide receivers got at least five targets, something like that. I mean, like, it's like, I mean, like, no, no, no yeah. none of them got more than five. I will say that after Kelsey, right? Yep, and uh, 11 players caught the ball from yeah. Patrick Mahomes. Nine had two plus receptions. <laughs> yeah, completely Like, inside. it was just totally I spread mean, around. just all... Sky Moore, after a bad, you know, week one, catches the touchdown, has 70 yards. Justin Watson got a couple of deep balls there. Like, he's a, he's a top 10 in Here air yards um, per target. You see it there on your screen, the receiving leaders, right? So, Sky Moore, four targets. Here's just targets. Sky Moore with four, Justin Watson with five, Noah Gray with three, Kadarius Toney with five, Kelsey gets the nine, McKinnon with three, Rasheed Rice with two, CEH with two, Marquez Valdez, Gantling with three, three and again it's just sort of like okay so sky Moore winds up with a touchdown 70 yards justin watson three for 62 he also got a he also had a big play that resulted in a pass interference that moved the chains down as well i do think justin watson's sort of interesting but they just they just have too many guys and i just don't know that you can count honestly on any of them other than travis kelsey like, I don't feel like if you're desperate, you know, you might as well take a dart throw. And if you're in a DFS, if you're playing in a, you know, a, a tournament and a GPP, then sure, by all means, throw a dart throw on a, on an MVS or a Rasheed Rice or a Justin Watson or a Sky Moore and hoping they catch a touchdown or something because they'll all be cheap. But like, I don't know. It's not just also that there's so many guys. It's that they're not playing well either. These two weeks have been two of the five worst games of Patrick Mahomes' career in terms of the team's success rate mm. on offense. They just don't look right. And these receivers just aren't playing well, Connor. I mean, what did you see from Sky Moore yesterday? Was that, a, you think, a significant improvement from week one? Not really. I thought one of the catches was kind of a fluky breakdown. And that's yep. part of starting mm. somebody on the Chiefs. I understand that. But I, there just doesn't seem to be... They're not playing in rhythm as yeah. much as we expect. It's good for their offense that they are spreading. They're not as volume heavy with Kelsey, and they can still win a game. 
but it just doesn't feel like the receivers are playing in rhythm with Mahomes right now. Yeah, th this was an ugly game. I, I, even even Pacheco. I mean, Pacheco, I think, wound up with like 70 yards or something on like that. 12 but, carries, but, yeah, but nothing in the pass game. Not that he was nothing in the pass game, and still, you know, again, CEH and McKinnon, I think you can easily forget those guys as nothing other than insurance to Pacheco, but Pacheco's not getting enough work. They didn't score a lot. I mean, Mahomes bailed you out because he got like 30 yards rushing and I think ultimately wound up over with over 300. So you were fine with the, the fantasy performance with Mahomes, but I agree with you. They're not playing in rhythm. So, you know, um, the game was in Jacksonville. I mean, whatever, you know, playing in Florida in September is hot as yeah, hell. And so it's, First week back for Kelsey off the injury as well. They'll be fine. It's They'll just, be fine. It's awkward They'll be fine. But the, but the takeaway is just like Mahomes, Kelsey, maybe Pacheco, yep. and that's it. Yep. The Correct. funniest thing, my biggest takeaway from this game is when you look at Trevor Lawrence not having a good week in fantasy at all is Chris Jones comes off the couch and wrecks the game. <laughs> yeah. So Dude. when you're starting a quarterback against Kansas City, now you have to worry about Chris Jones completely taking over the game yeah. once again. So with that, we'll move to uh, a thriller of the week. Seattle, scrappy Seattle, bounces back from a tough week one and beats the Lions at Detroit in an overtime thriller. Just when everybody wrote Geno Smith off once again, Geno Smith 32 of 41 for 328 yards and two touchdowns. And Tyler Lockett bounces back, Barry, from a pretty weak uh, week one where he was banged up as well. He was great, eight for 59 and two touchdowns. He got 50% of the team's red zone targets, 100% of the team's end zone targets. This is what he does. I, I always love the, Kevin Clark tweeted this out. Um, you know, but just like Seattle's, imp it's impossible for Seattle to play a normal game. Yep. They can't. It, it's, yep. There's always something weird that happens in a Seattle game, and this was no different. It was a, just kind of a, a crazy back and forth. But I think the positives are is that concerns about Geno Smith as a viable fantasy quarterback, I think, once again, were shown up incorrect, right? He finished, he, as we ended in Monday Night Football, he's the seventh best quarterback in fantasy this week. Tyler Lockett is a top six wide receiver as well. DK Metcalf had some moments as well. We're still waiting on JSN, but it was a big game from Ken Walker as well. Seattle offense is what we thought it was going to be. Yep. Now, Geno Smith played great overall, but he had one of the worst plays I've ever seen a quarterback uh, have where 90 seconds to go, third and eight, and they're trying to run out the clock, and he starts to run, and then he realizes there's nothing there, and then he scrambles back with 17 yards and seems to forget that he's a quarterback who can actually throw the ball away, but he's committed to running the ball, right. and then he gets sacked at the three that for a 17-yard loss. Yeah. To almost That almost ended their season if they go down 0-2. Yeah. But anyway, outside of that, it was a very Geno Smith performance where he has that play, but then it was also brilliant outside of that and look this is going to be this team's going to be in a lot of shootouts because that defense isn't good but at least the offensive line was stable enough where looked like it might not be viable he was only sacked once though uh but, and so those receivers are going to be viable yeah too. which by the way given the offensive line injuries that were that were there coming to the game the fact that Gino had a pretty clean pocket is great carolina giants Bengals, arizona those are the next four seattle none of those defenses scare you um, so, uh, especially a home game to the Panthers, who will be traveling on a short week as they play tonight. Uh, things should keep rolling for the Hawks. On the Lions side of things, scary moment with David Montgomery being carted off with a thigh injury, but Dan Campbell said after the game, it looks like a thigh bruise, so maybe escape the worst here, Jay, for looks David Looks like it's going to be a couple weeks, we, though. though yeah. yeah, yeah. so Adam Schefter reporting uh, that uh, earlier, just before we went on air, that David Montgomery said the injury could take quote, a couple of weeks to heal. My expectation is, is assuming that's correct, um, so we'll see. It's rare, because usually players are like, I'll be back tomorrow, yeah. and you'll be like, your leg is broken. <laughs> yeah. Literally, you're, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, it's literally like- Aaron like, Rodgers is finally back by like, week 12. I'm like, I'm going to be back <laughs> in work week six, and you're like, you have So usually players are super positive, right? Players and Pete Carroll are the two that are just like, yeah, it's flesh wound. Literally, his arm's off, dude. Yeah. Like, so, you know, the old Mike Python sketch. Good. So it didn't look Dan it didn't Campbell look after good. the game kind of just played but, it off. But yeah. Mon right, but Montgomery, right. the fact when a player, by the way, and this is a player, by the way, hit, who traditionally has never been injured. I, I don't oh, believe yeah. he's missed a game due to injury in his career. Certainly not a Chicago. He plays through a lot of he things. He plays through a lot of yeah. tough guys. So if he's going to miss a couple of weeks, I think the natural inclination, inclination is, is like, ah, oh, Jameer Gibbs, finally. And I do think his workload will increase, but – Craig Reynolds is the guy that I think will actually take the Dave Montgomery role. Like, again, you'll see an uptick in work for Jameer Gibbs, but it's not all of a sudden going to be all Gibbs. I actually think it'll be Craig Reynolds that gets kind of the between the tackles, the, the down and dirty stuff, the in close stuff. So Craig Reynolds, we'll talk about more, talk about him more tomorrow during the waiver wire show, but just 
heads up there. It was a very fantasy managers on Twitter as soon as Montgomery went down and everyone's expecting the Jimmy Gibbs explosion. Like, oh, no, it's no. going to be the Craig Reynolds show. Can Gibbs, why is this kind of, do you think? Can he not handle a three-down workload? He's a smaller player. I mean, he checked in under 200 pounds at the Combine. He was not asked to be that guy at Alabama. And the Lions don't want him to be that guy because they think it'll cost him his effectiveness. And he led the team in targets with nine. Yep. I mean, yep. we said this all summer. Jameer Gibbs, they want him to be their prime Alvin Kamara. And they're living up to that. This is yeah. what he's asked to do, nine targets. And it was a good fantasy day for Jared Goff. Right. In right. this game. A hundred percent. So just off Gibbs, right? Targeted on 41% of his routes. He played 71% of the snaps after Dave Montgomery left, including a hundred percent on third and fourth down. And he played one on one inside the tent. Having said that he was out there some of the time with Craig Reynolds. They had both guys out there because Craig Reynolds played 41% of the snaps after the Monty injury, three different plays. He was out there on the field with Jameer Gibbs. And I think as they practice this week and get ready, uh, get ready for the Falcons. Good matchup there. As they get ready for the Falcons this week, uh, Detroit, will probably work more in terms of, you know, how to get Gibbs and Reynolds on the field at the same time. So Reynolds will be the guy again. He didn't do much, whatever. Two, uh, three rushes, seven yards. He caught one ball. Um, and so Gibbs will have an uptick. But yeah, Craig Reynolds is going to be a thing. David Montgomery, 19 touches a game in the first two weeks of the season. That's what he was averaging. That's that role on that team. How about Josh Reynolds in this game, though? Five receptions. He's a thing. He makes the most of them. He is a thing. Two touchdowns in this game. And same could be said for Sam Laporta, who it feels like he's going to be consistently featured uh, in this offense as a rookie tight end. Five catches on six targets for 63 yards. Yeah, uh, he's tied for the second most targets on the team in week two. Josh Reynolds, to your point, 12 or more fantasy points in each of the first two weeks. It's going to be a thing. And again, given the matchup with Atlanta this week, you like how this Lions offense is starting to look, at least until Jamison Williams comes back, where we'll have, I think, more clarity. But yeah. Jared Goff continues to do Jared Goff-like things. Moving over to another thriller that I don't think a lot of people were ready for. The Giants <laughs> in Arizona. The Giants had a real scare in this game. They ultimately come back, pull off the uh, the big-time comeback. But at a cost here, Jay, where Saquon Barkley leaves the game in the fourth quarter with an ankle injury. It, it sounds like he might have avoided the worst. It could be a sprain. We haven't officially gotten there yet. But his body language after this injury was not great. He's going to be out a while, yeah. I think, Saquon. I would they're not on a short week, too, yeah, by the they're way. They're on a short week, so that's not expecting. They're, that's a, they're the Thursday night game at San Francisco this week. Yeah. I would be shocked if he plays this week. But I mean, this is a ridiculous game. <laughs> I mean, this, oh, was it was completely insane. Look, Josh Jobs was excellent. He's probably the better yeah. quarterback in the matchup. I don't know what you read into this from a fantasy perspective. I mean, Darren Waller, who was under an injury cloud, he looked fantastic. Fantastic, six for 76 on eight targets. But, I mean, Matthew is Matt Breida. Is he, is he the guy for you now? I think it's going to be a mixture between him and Gary Brightwell. Would be, and they're playing San Francisco. That's so. a <laughs> weird, strange <laughs> sentence. Right, but I know. But, like, so I think, I think it's ideally a situation to avoid. Again, we don't have anyone on by. So it depends on your injury situation. Like, if you had David Montgomery and you, you miss out on, you know, on Craig Reynolds and some of the other guys. And so, you know, you may be forced to start one of those guys. So I think Brita over Brightwell at the moment, he's the one that first – right. But, Oof. I mean, like, again, it's – How did we get here in week two? <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> – Gary Brightwell. You know. Like um, British actor. <laughs> listen, Kyron Williams ran well against the Niners, so who knows? You never know. Um, I Look, I, I had Daniel Jones on my love list, and I was just like, oh, God, what did I do? First week, you know, um, first <laughs> half of the year. They had us in the first half. First half, I'm just like, oh, yeah. God, what did I do? That was uh, that was a mistake. And, um, look, he, he, he came back. He came through. Like, obviously, uh, this is – it's going to be a struggle on the road at San Francisco in a short week. But the fact is, is that that's what we expect out of Daniel Jones. This is You guys all mocked me for taking him as my number two quarterback in our in our show league, by let's, the way. We'll, and we'll see how Friday morning we'll have that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fine. Just whatever. Listen, everyone, it feels like the Giants are having this absolute season from hell. Got the same record as the Chiefs and the Bills. The Giants <laughs> live. They're, they're better than the they're Bengals. They're not done yet. Yep. The they got yeah. more wins than the Bengals. Yeah. So, um... Yeah, it, def it was looking like, oh, God, their season's over. Because, again, if they were 0-2 heading into San Francisco, we talked about this Sunday morning on Fantasy Football Pregame, that this was a must-win for the Giants, and they ultimately did. Daniel Jones, you know, is, as we head into Monday Night Football, the number one quarterback in fantasy, 9 for 59 and a touchdown. That's, to me, the most exciting thing is, again, the continual, the continuous, the continue. why can't I speak English? The, the continuation of the use of his legs, that, yes. that that it is a viable thing. It's not all scrambles. It, they are designed runs. It is a part of their offense here as well. Uh, you know, Jalen Hyatt makes the makes a big catch. Isaiah Hodgins catches the touchdown. Waller was obviously involved. Doesn't feel like 
you can trust it other than Daniel Jones, who I think is continues to be a viable low end QB one moving forward, even against the Niners. Uh, if Barkley's out, like it's it's Darren Waller, and that's it. I don't think you feel great about any offensive player here because again, they do sort of spread it around. Yep, absolutely. And I mean, there were some uh, deceiving lines from rookie rookie wide receivers, and you know, Jalen Hyatt goes gets 89 yards, but it's on two catches, and there's a 58 yarder in there. Marvin Mims, the same thing. That stuff is not going to be sustainable. Wait, Marvin Mims ran five routes. Yes. I mean, like again, I love <laughs> yeah. Marvin Mims. Just five more I than main. And right, yeah. and they 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 should use him more, but like. Forgetting the numbers, he ran five routes. Yep. Daniel Jones reminds me of Kirk Cousins when he was wearing that jersey, except with rushing ability as well, where yeah. he is very competent and he can fill it up in garbage time. Yeah. You like that. Our, our last game here, the Niners uh, traveled to Los Angeles to play the Rams in a game that ended up a little closer. The the funny field goal at the end of this game. Talk about a bad beat, Jay. But I think the story from a fan. Or a great beat. It depends on which yeah. way you bet. Yeah, it depends well, which way. Well, you're going to get the best of the number. That's yeah. seven and a half and seven. That's right. The story of this game, though, from a fantasy perspective, is definitely the skill players of the Rams, despite them losing this game, Barry. I mean, Kyron Williams, big game, most notably through the pass game. And Puka Nakua was targeted 20 times yeah. in this game. 20 times. Is Cooper Cup going to get back on the field? I, I tell my daughters, I tell my 11-year-old daughters, I said, listen, I said, when you're ready to date, you find yourself somebody that looks at you the way Matthew Stafford looks at Puka Nakua. And then they're like, Dad, why are you talking weird again? And then they go off and get on TikTok or something like that. Um, I'm really connecting with my daughters these days. But uh, uh, maybe I should choose something other than Puka Nakua. But the fact of the matter is, is like, it, like the target share is unbelievable. The most catches by any wide receiver after his first two career games in NFL history. Like Puka Nakua is literally making NFL history. He's got 35 targets through two games. The second most is Justin Jefferson with 25 targets. Not only is it the most targets of any wide receiver in the, in the league, but he's like 10 more than number two. Like, it's just insane. Through week, uh, week two, he had a 38.5% target share. Like, it's, it's unbelievable. And by the way, I just want to say this. I'm not sitting here telling you that I thought any of this would happen. Because I didn't, obviously. I didn't think any of this would happen. That he would, you know, set an NFL record for targets or anything like this. But if you don't have him on your team, you have no one to blame but yourself. Roll the tape. <laughs> I'll just say that, uh, you know, my, my friend and, and former colleague, Jim Nagy, who would do some stuff occasionally for us over at ESPN. Of course, Jim runs the Senior Bowl, does a great job there. Jim's an avid fantasy player, and he, he told me that, you know, and he, he looks at all these, uh, all these kids coming out. He just told me he thinks Puka special. And for whatever it's worth, he drafted Puka to his fantasy team. So um, that's a guy that I think is really interesting to sort of keep an eye on as the season goes on. For the record, right. I was uh, at that Senior and Bowl I, week, and he's gotten more targets in two weeks of NFL play than practicing at the Senior <laughs> Bowl. <laughs> right. I mean, this is, this is truly unbelievable. It is truly unbelievable. But, but again, obviously, when I said keep an eye on him, I meant pick him up and stash him because <laughs> it's going to be the first two weeks are going to be awesome. You begged us September not to 7th. show that. For the record. Yeah. For the, the pre show call, you're like, please don't show that. I want to be really humble. I want to be humble. I don't, I don't want to remind wanna, people I, that they should have already gotten him. Two right. Weeks I don't want to bring up that I brought yeah. him up on September 7th before any of the games that have been they played. They surprised us and played right. anyway. Right. You know, but whatever. They played it anyway. Steve and D'Agostino. Ah. Uh, so embarrassing. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't yeah. want a victory lap because you know me. I'm always about the work. I'm never about. I'm never about victory lapping. I'm always about the work. Always just about you know grinding. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you definitely yeah. didn't make me do a victory lap for you when you were in Kansas City. <laughs> yeah, right, right, so. definitely, didn't, definitely, yeah. definitely didn't do that. I'm definitely not wearing a Commanders yeah. jersey now. It, the thing uh, with Puka, this no, is this is I'll, completely sustainable. It's this yeah, insane target share. He's that good. I watched every second of this game because I was trying to get my Christian McCaffrey bet home. Yeah. And, Matthew Stafford looks unbelievable at the moment, and they are getting protection as well. Uh, and Tutu Atwell as well. I don't know how he became so good all of a sudden, but he was fantastic. I think his role will recede when Cup comes back, but they're going to need multiple guys. And if Stafford keeps playing this well and yes. is healthy, he can support two wide receivers, and it's going to be Cup and it's going to be Nakua. Yeah, 100%. Like, is Nakua's value at an all-time high, all high? Of course it is. When Cup, Cup comes back in week five, we expect Nakua's target share to go down, but you're not going to get fair value for Puka Nakua. Like you just can't like, so I was in, I'm literally in a group chat in one of my leagues. And one of the guys said, I will accept Justin Jefferson for Puka Nakua. <laughs> and literally that's it. Yeah. I'd rather have Puka Nakua than like T Higgins or Garrett Wilson. I mean, it's the rest un, of the way. But well, Garrett Wilson, for sure. Um, T Higgins, I'm borderline there, but like, I mean, it is like, 
Anyway, the point of the matter is, is that all of us think this is much more legit than not even when Cooper Cup comes back. If you do have Puka Nakua, if you did listen to the show on uh, September 7th and that name rang a bell, uh, you can thank me and Jim Nagy, actually. Thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, Got to give him credit there as well. The other thing that I think is really interesting about this game very quickly is the Cam Akers saga. Does We talked about this on Fantasy pregame, but like it's just like, you know, they love him. He's getting shared like last year. Like they hated him. They wanted, he's a healthy scratch. Then they're going to trade him. Then all of a sudden he gets all the work. And then this year all is good. And he's going to be the guy. He was running with the ones in the, in the preseason. And then he's backseat to Kyron Williams in, in week one. And then he's a healthy scratch in week two. And now reports are this morning that they're actively trying to trade him. Again. Good luck with that. Again. Like, I mean, like, good luck trying on training to them. But the fact that, like, Cam Akers, I think, is useless until he finds his way onto another NFL team. Kyron Williams, completely legitimate. He looked great in what is, I think, the toughest matchup that he'll have this year. Here's our upcoming schedule. They play the Bengals in Night Football, as we said, at Indy, home to Philly, home to Arizona. So tough matchups, right. but not as bad as San Francisco. Kyron Williams is a real deal. He's the running back, too, as we head into Monday Night Football. And with that, we'll take our first break. When we're back, we're looking at the Sunday scaries and, of course, those weekend warriors. Did I mention my commanders are 2-0? Did we get to that in the first I think break? We missed that. Does Mike Evans cease to amaze you? No, I mean, we have we have Mike Evans on our team. Are you kidding me? What are you at, 175 today? Yeah. <laughs> Mike's, a, Mike's a dog. I, I love him to death. You know, he's out there balling, um, doing his thing. That was Bucks offensive lineman Tristan Wirfs on the greatness of Mike Evans, which takes us to our weekend warriors. Of course, Mike Evans tops the list here, guys. Six catches on eight targets, and boy, did he make the most of them. 171 yards and a touchdown. Barry, I begged and pleaded with you to take my bucks over the Bears <laughs> secondary. But Jay was right as well, so I can't yeah. really victory lap that, sadly. No, you both can. I, I thought the Bears would uh, would cover the two and a half, and they did not. Because right. they're, they're only um, seven and a half points off. They yes. <laughs> there have been worse losses. Well, uh, if Justin Fields doesn't throw that, you know, ridiculous pick to Shaq Barrett, I mean, they were only down three. Is Justin Fields any good? It's I, not. I, lo- it's not looking good. I mean, we he are trending throw. rapidly it, towards them moving in a different direction. This is year season. three now, and he still can't throw. He doesn't look comfortable. Yeah. The offense isn't very well. Dr- it's all. It's all bad. Yeah. It's all bad right there. It's a, it's a, it's a but disaster. But it's Warriors. Bleak. So we'll get to Justin Fields uh, during okay. a different part of this show called Sunday Scaries. But a big day for Mike Evans, of course. Also a big day for Raheem Mostert. He gets 18 carries, goes for 121 yards and two touchdowns on a good New England defense that they might have just been tired in this game. And the fact is right now there is just so much stress this Miami offense is putting on the opposition, Barry, under Mike McDaniel. Yeah, I mean, right. There's not much we can talk about Mike Evans other than the fact that, like, I think – Real quickly before we move on to Mostert, I just want to say very quickly on Mike Evans. I think what, even though, whatever, the Bears are bad, I think what Baker Mayfield proved is, regardless of, we'll talk tomorrow as to whether, like, he's a deep quarterback league ad, but uh, he's going to be viable enough to support Evans and Godwin and and uh, Rashad White as well. Like, I mean, that that's the important thing. That's all we care about is those three guys. Baker's back to being an average NFL quarterback, and that's all that Mike Evans needs. Correct. Factually correct. As for Raheem must start, as he's been told, as he's told me privately, <laughs> that he wants <laughs> to be called, uh, not on air. On air, he mentioned Raheem the dream, but <laughs> privately to me, um, he said I'm, Raheem must start. Look, I, they, they, they made it a point to take away Tyreek Hill in that game. That much was clear which obviously opened up running lanes here. That offense is running on all cylinders. It's fantastic. The fact that, um, uh, by the way, Savon Ahmed got banged up in this game. He left. It doesn't seem like they're ready to trust Devon A-Chain. Obviously, Jeff Wilson is on IR. So Raheem Mostert gets the two touchdowns. But, you know, and they were leading this game uh, for the most part. Raheem Mostert has never been um, untalented. The question is never with him has always been health and playing time. Yep. Right? I mean, like he's always he's always had this talent. He's always had the breakaway speed, uh, but he's now getting playing time and he's healthy. Ray Mostert is the guy that everyone wants Rashad Penny to be. Where basically yeah. every time he's out there and healthy, he's five and a half yards per carry. It's what he's done his entire career. And if he is getting the kind of workload that he's getting at the moment, then he's an elite running back. The thing is, it's probably not going to last because it never does. But until it doesn't, then he is very, very viable through in the, fantasy. Through the first two weeks of the season, he's the ninth best running back in fantasy. Um, he played 74% of the snaps last night. And 
we talked about this in the preseason, just saying, like, we didn't understand how low his ADP was. Now, this has obviously all been helped by the fact that Jeff Wilson Jr. is on IR and A-Chain, but we were just like, everyone's drafting Devon A-Chain as if he is clearly the starter, and then Wilson was going way ahead of most, and we're like, this is kind of a split, and we just, we didn't understand Mostert's ADP. Uh, certainly, some things have broken in his favor, but yes, not a fluke. They're home to Denver, uh, a Broncos team that, by the way, just got run over by my commanders and number eight. Uh, number eight on the field, number one in your heart, Brian Robinson. Yeah, and this Miami offense is just, it's a wagon. It's completely unstoppable. They're going to be winning a lot of games and running the ball in the second half as they were last night. Sticking with the running backs here, another player you liked at Costberry was James Cook. He's yeah. not getting the red zone work, but it doesn't matter. 17 rushes, 123 yards, and more notably, his involvement in the pass game this year. Four catches for 36 yards after a game against the Jets last week where he caught the ball a lot too. That's, that's, that's the key right there is he's getting the passing game involvement. Like, the touchdowns will come. I, I get it. Like, it was a bummer, right? So far this season, he's only gotten two red zone touches. Latavius Murray has gotten five. Damian Harris has gotten four. Both Harris and Murray get into the end zone in this one. But at some point, I think they look around and they look at this and, like, those two guys are averaging basically under four yards a carry. I think James Cook in this game averaged over seven. James Cook is by far the most explosive guy. Although, I will say this. Latavius Murray's touchdown was an impressive one. Like, he bowled a <laughs> – like, I was just like, all right, damn, you right, still got it. Like, um, they're going to continue to be a thorn, and it's why James Cook is more of an RB2 than an RB1. But uh, the fact of the matter is it's an explosive offense – uh, and they're going to use him quite a bit. Josh Allen is not scared to dump it off to him. So that's the exciting thing. Yeah, James Cook, uh, top 10 running back so far uh, as we head into Monday Night Football. Once again, another running back, Zach Moss, goes off. Anthony Richardson had to leave the game for the Colts due to the uh, going into concussion protocol. Zach Moss, 18 rushes, 88 yards. He gets the touchdown. He also catches four passes for 19 yards. Not a player you'd expect that from Jay, Zach Moss. It's, it, that's going to help his production a lot if he has any kind of involvement, even as a checkdown guy. Yep, and he's going to be the guy for the next two weeks until Jonathan Taylor, who apparently is 100% right. healthy based on the videos, but is on the pup list for reasons uh, that are unknown. Uh, and until that point, Moss is going to be very viable. And look, Anthony Richardson, uh, who had a scary concussion, if he's going to be out... I mean, Gardner Minshew is fine. Gardner Minshew is a good backup quarterback, and I don't think it really impacts the rest of the offense too negatively. Obviously, Richardson himself has a lot more upside and we expect will be better in the future. But for the time being, Gardner Minshew, I think, gives these guys as much opportunity to succeed as Richardson. He played on 98% of the snaps. This is Zach Moss. It's clearly his backfield. Worth noting, though, they're at Baltimore, then home to the Rams, home to Tennessee, which in mm. theory might be the game that Jonathan Taylor comes back for, and then at Jacksonville. So... I wouldn't go crazy for Zach Moss, but again, if you're looking – and they, they clearly want to run the ball, and if Richard, Anthony Richardson's going to miss any time, Zach Moss would get more of uh, a workload. We'll talk about where we wanted, where we, we would target him if he's still available in your league on the way we'll show tomorrow. But, yeah, look, in a good situation, he did what you should do, which is he got all the work and he converted. Our last two weekend Warriors, well, if you watched fantasy football pregame, you would have already known. Listen in. This is from yesterday. Today will be the coming out party for a Texans wide receiver. Now, right. I don't know if it's going to be Nico Collins or Tank Dell. Or John Mechie making his normal way to nah, professional. It could be John or Mechie. Xavier Robert, Hutchinson? Robert no, Woods? it's not, oh. not going to be Robert Woods. Okay. It's not going to be John Mechie. He's okay. in the slot. He's going right. up against Kenny Moore. It's not going to be either of those guys. Okay. It's either going to be Tank Dell or Nico Collins. Okay. And I rank Nico over Tank, but one of those guys is going to have himself a day to day right. for the Texans against the Colts. Again, I, I beg them not to show this clip. I want to surprise you. I, thank yeah, you. Yeah. I appreciate it, Connor. It's very kind of you. Again, I'm just about grinding, doing the work. I'm just out here trying to help people, just moving the ball forward, not right. looking back and celebrating my wins. But let's be clear, that was a win. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's, you know just as long as it's played, as long as it's being talked about, I just – the fact is – the fact is, is that I was wrong because it wasn't T uh, Nico Collins or Tank Dell. It was both of them. It was both of them. I was right on both of them, Jay. Sometimes my genius just can't help itself. It just, it just spills it out of me. Yes. It just makes overwhelms me. Makes a big mess. Me. Makes a big a old mess. A thousand percent. A thousand percent. Thank you for not bringing up the Kirk Cousins on my hate list, <laughs> hate list this week. Uh, the fact is, yeah, it just, it just sometimes I can't help myself. I think it just spills out. One of the big, uh, big takeaways yesterday is that CJ Stroud was quietly excellent yes, yesterday thank you. in a way that he wasn't in Week One, but he had a 9.3 yards average depth of target. 
Nico Collins and Tank Dell, they're both good. They're yeah. both very solid. And if Stroud is that good, here's the thing. They can't keep him upright because the offensive line is a mess. Brutal. He's taken 11 sacks in yeah. two games. They're missing they will, a lot of guys. They will get some yeah. guys off the IR, I think, in week five. I think they're just gonna, he's just going to survive and stay alive for two more weeks. But Stroud is better than expected, I think, and Collins and Dell are as well. Yeah, look, and we're going to talk about uh, Damian Pierce in a second here. Mm. But, yeah, that's a concern. That four of their five offensive line starters <laughs> are missing, are bad. injured. And so you given the fact that they can't run the ball effectively for a variety of reasons. They're down in games and so they're going to throw. Nico Collins and Tank Dell are very talented. And to your point, CJ Stroud has shown enough that you're like, there have been some rough spots. But like, there's also where you're like, that kid can play. That kid can play. I, I think the accuracy has been impressive so far. And so at some point, and I think it's going to be sooner rather than later, at some point, the Texans are going to sit here and go like, you know what? Robert Woods isn't part of our future. I mean, like, they need they need more. I mean, already we're seeing Nico Collins and Tank Dell, both of whom, like, again, if you miss the game, 7 for 146 and a touchdown for Nico Collins, 23% target share so far this year. He's had at least five receptions in five of his past six games, dating back to last year. Ding. Tank Dell, by the way, 10 targets in week till. We talked about the connection between Stroud and Tank Dell. 78% of snaps when you think about week one when he only played up 45%. I said in the preseason, Tank Dell is going to be a thing this year. It's already happening. Same with Nico Collins. Again, you're welcome, America. God bless. Fantasy football pregame every Sunday, 11 a.m. Eastern on Peacock. Tune in. Get smarter. Get wins. Don't have to chase guys like Nico Collins or Tank Dell on the the, uh, waiver wire because you'll already have them on your team. Again, I'm about the work. I appreciate you guys, but let's move on. Let's not talk about me anymore. Let's just move on. Again, I'm just about the work. I Again, I know some people are saying it's a great call. Some people are saying, not me, but some people are saying, what an amazing call. The best call since I called Nuka. The work. Since I called Puka. Again, just about the work. Let's Those are the on. guys that dominated, but unfortunately, every Sunday comes with the scaries. And we kind of talked about this guy briefly, but Justin Fields leads the list. 16 to 29, 211 yards, has a touchdown, but also throws two interceptions. It's just hard right now, Jay, to have a lot of faith in what this Bears offense is trying to do and the fact that Fields is not getting it done. They just seem like a broken team, more than any other team in the league right now, to be honest, because at least Arizona are fighting. Houston are fighting. This team's got nothing right now. And he had four carries for three yards That's as well. Thing. which is He's just, not running. Yeah. So that just kills you because he's not providing value in the passing game. He averaged 149 passing yards a game last year. He's never been a good passer. And if he's not giving you... 10 carries for 65, yeah. 70 yards, then you're no chance. I'm not, dro- I'm not dropping him, but I am looking for alternatives if Justin, until he gets it straightened out here. Especially because, by the way, De- Deontay Foreman was a, was a scratch in this game, so Rashawn Johnson and, and Khalil Herbert were clearly a committee there. That's how they want to run the ball. DeAndre Hopkins, another player that makes the list. He only has four catches on five targets for 40 yards. And Hopkins, it was really a question down to the wire, Barry, if he was even going to play in this game. He might not be at full strength right now. I think it's safe to say he's not at full strength. Yeah, I mean, like, he didn't practice all week. He was a game-time decision. He still, so far this year, has a 31% target share. Tannehill was brutal in week one. He's less than healthy. I actually think he's a buy-low candidate. Two running backs that had brutal days. Damian Pierce gets the volume, 15 rushes, only 31 yards. Brees Hall does not, only four carries for nine yards. Jay, you already talked about the Texans. Their offensive line is in shambles. Bad news for Pierce. With the Jets, they and, just didn't And thank you for not bringing up the fact that I was really high on Pierce throughout the preseason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the offensive line is just non-viable. And the Jets don't have a good offensive line either, right. sneakily there. And look, Zach Dallas Wilson. is going to kill yeah, a lot of teams, yeah. too. We'll see who's quarterback for the Jets out of the bye in a few weeks because I'm yeah. not sure it's going to be Zach Wilson. Yeah, I, I'm not worried about Brees Hall. And Damian Pierce, I think you just have to hang top again because I think w- the offensive line will get better. Hall, you're still starting. Pierce, it depends on the matchup. Yeah, my bigger takeaway is I'd be worried about Dalvin Cook. Brutal yes. fumble, yeah. looks bad. Brees looks good. He just didn't get the ball. Our last right. guy here, I hate to say it, but it feels like we have this conversation every other week. It's Kyle Pitts. Two catches, five targets, 15 yards. Desmond Ritter game. was awful in that game. Yeah. He's, he's not good at the moment, Desmond Ritter, and Kyle Pitts is suffering as a result. Yeah, I mean, at least Drake London got on the, on the scoreboard, so it was great to see Drake London. But, again, Kyle Pitts, like, w- at least one of those guys is going to be unstartable every week. If Kyle Pitts is your starting tight end, you need to be uh, very, very nervous. By the way, speaking of that game, Falcons, uh, Packers, I just want to mention Jordan Love, who so far this season is the number two quarterback in fantasy points per game, averaging over 20. He's got six touchdown passes through two weeks. So if you're sitting there with a Justin Fields – I know, Jordan Love, we'll talk more about him tomorrow on waivers. We'll talk more about, well, probably me and my calls when we come back right after this. Plus a Monday Night Football preview. We've got that for you after the break. 
DraftKings Sportsbook is an official sports betting partner of the NFL, and today new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Download the app and use promo code Barry when you sign up. DraftKings Sportsbook, the crown is yours. Let's take a look here at the most bet props courtesy of our friends at DraftKings right now. Uh, Nick Chubb leads the board with ru his rushing yard total is at 75 and a half. The people are going over on that. They're also going over on Nick Chubb's longest rush over 17 and a half. Rashid Shaheed receiving yards over 36 and a yeah. half. I like that. Jamal Williams rushing yards over 52 and a half. Deshaun Watson rushing yards over 24 and a half. Jay, the public is all in on the rushing in this doubleheader tonight. Yes. I am not, though. I'm in on the receiving, Connor, and I'm in on an old friend of Matthew Barry's. My best bet tonight is Alan Robinson, the great That's Alan the Robinson, friend. over 31 and a half receiving yards. I think he's wide receiver one on this offense with Deontay Johnson out, or at least he's right there with George Pickens. He had eight targets in week one. He went five for 64. Uh, I think he goes over 31 and a half. I actually really like that bet. Thank you, Because I like Alan Robinson. Yeah. Uh, it's surprising the voice. Yeah. I, I actually, you know what? No, I like I, I like the call that. again because you know no Deontay Johnson and George Pickens his usage has yeah. been inconsistent as well. So uh, Robinson is pretty interesting to me. I'm also like I never like you always like to kind of fade the public and yet here I am riding with the public. But I will do this. I I will say this. I like Nick Chubb. To you, I'm using the alt line of a hundred or more rushing yards, right? So sure. the, the line is 75 and a half, but doing the alt line of a hundred rushing yards or more, it's at plus 165 right now on DraftKings. Look, he had 106 rushing yards last week. The Steelers last, their last week against San Francisco, they gave up over 150 rushing yards. No Cam Hayward in this game either, as well. We expect to be a we expect it to be a low scoring game, kind of a an AFC North drag mm -hmm. out. So yeah, if I'm doing it. Give me uh, Nick. If Nick Chubb's rushing for over 75, he's rushing for uh, over 100. Give me that of the outline at plus money. I like the thinking. The line has moved while we were taping to 82 and a half. That's how hard the public is hammering Nick Chubb's rushing over. I have one boring one. TJ Watt to get half a sack minus 166. If you want a longer shot, Deshaun Watson to throw a pick plus money plus 114. Deshaun Watson. His decision making kind of a roller coaster against this. I know the Awful Steelers pick and wake Yeah, really, really bad interception. I know the Steelers defense is banged up. No Cam Hayward, as you said, but they still got ball. Play they still got ballers on the back end. So They're we'll see better than they showed against yes, San Francisco. 100%. They can't be that bad again, you would think. Yeah. By the way, I, I know Rashid Shahid. They, they, everyone likes the over on the receiving yards there, but I actually think you know. Um, I think your guy Michael Thomas might actually mm. have Michael a, Thomas might oh. actually have a game tonight. My old friend. Your old friend. You're giving me Allen Robinson. I'm giving Michael <laughs> yeah. Thomas. Like it's, it's old wide receiver day here on the happy hour. Look, it's closing time. And you know what that means? It means that you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Uh, you could go to the streets. You could buy commander's gear. To that the would streets. be a place to do it. Onwards, yeah, to exactly. The yeah, Listen, for Jake Crasher and Connor Rogers, I'm Matthew Berry. We will see you back here tomorrow for waivers. Good luck tonight. Peace out. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBCSports.com and RotorWorld.com, and I want to thank you so much for watching whatever it is you just watched, or if nothing else, being too lazy to click out of the autoplay after this video started, after whatever it is you actually wanted to watch finished. But now that you're here, I'd like to take a moment here to ask you respectfully, respectfully now, okay, I'm asking you respectfully to subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel. You'll get the latest Roto World fantasy news headlines, all sorts of great shows, including my own Fantasy Football Happy Hour. So go subscribe now. Again, I'm asking respectfully.